Shalom and welcome to Practical Spirituality here at Asia Torah in the old city of Jerusalem overlooking the Temple Mount. Hey, by the way, can you please go on my live feed on Facebook and see if this works better? Facebook. You know, Facebook? No, I do I'm supposed to hire you for my social media? No, I do it. Okay. Um, one sec. Uh, does anyone have me on Facebook? Just to check if the volume's you better. Can you, oh, you have me on Facebook? Can you run outside and see if the volume's better with my earpiece? Okay. Okay, very good. Now, um, now, I don't even know if this is pumping through this thing, but I think it might be. I hope it is. Okay? Um, just give me a thumbs up through the window. I'll tap on it. You'll tell me if this is what's working. I don't know if my headphones can I can still... Yeah, it doesn't matter. Just give me a thumbs up through the window, and I'll tap on it, and you'll tell me if you heard the tap. Okay, you got that? We'll do a sound check. And please, everyone, join my media club. You know, I started a club. Media Club. It's called YomTomediaClub.com, and yeah, YomTomediaClub.com. And what it is is people who like my crazy classes, who feel like these crazy classes could somehow make a difference for somebody somewhere, is they join the club. It's a set and forget. You use the tiniest amount of money that you would totally forget that you were sending to the media club. I mean, you want to totally forget it. It's a set and forget. Just you, meaning the student level is like ten dollars. You forget about it. And I, by the way, I have about. I don't know, maybe 10 set and forgets for people I believe in. Anyone I believe is making a difference, I just set and forget something for them. Because I just want, when, when I die, and like I know someone made an awesome contribution, I want a piece of me in their contribution. So I have like 10 set and forgets. And I keep adding them, and my secretary every year is like, what the hell are you doing, man? You're like hemorrhaging money off random people. Yeah, you're like hemorrhaging money off random people that you don't even know. And I'm like, yeah, but YouTube video that guy, he's awesome. He's awesome and he's making a difference. Anyway, so I created that. And uh, we're about to hire. We finally broke a shim. We finally broke through to being able to hire our first person, which is amazing. And all those $10 students out there, you rock, because that was the dream. Not that I don't appreciate the larger amounts. But the, the $10, that's all I wanted. I just wanted 10 bucks from like 2,000 people and just hire a whole staff. And he's interviewing today at 1.30. Yeah. Okay, listen up. That can't be possible. Something's wrong. God... <laughs> don't worry about it. We'll do it another day. God is called king over and over again in Judaism. He's, he's always called king. In fact, in every blessing, we call God the king of the universe. Rosh Hashanah is like full-on brainwash, where we call him our father and our king over and over and over and over again. I mean, it's a little bizarre, you know. Avina Malkina, Avina Malkina, Avina Malkina. And then, like, the full brainwash hits you on Kipper, where you're fasting, you're weak and worthless, you are, you've lost all your resolution. And Avina Malkina, Avina Malkina, our father, our king, our father, our king, our father, our king, our father, our king, our father, our king. And we're, like, trying to indelibly mark this into our skull, like, like just like tefillin is, like, putting God, men have to put tefillin over this little aperture up here. It has to be above your hairline, so it's over the aperture, you know, the baby soft spot. That aperture is called, it's on every skull, and it's called the fontanelle, the fountain of God. And that's sitting right over the atheist, which is, the atheist is you, no offense, but the atheist is your, it's not really you, it's your cerebral cortex, which is full of neurons that only get touch, smell, sight, sound, and all that. And unlike women, men have to have, like, God impressed upon their their, uh, their, uh, um, their on, on their neurons every morning. And this is why I pity the food puts on us to fill right before sundown, which is like the majority of Hasidic young men, and, um, meaning before they're married, and, they, and every other slacker. And uh, so you want that on your, you want that over your neurons in the morning before you start your day. You know, it's like kissing a mezuzah when you leave your house in the morning. Of course, none of these people leave their house in the morning anyway, but they, I mean, they're asleep in the morning because it's really hard to run into your Rosh Hashiva when you're only awake from midnight. Now, now the, uh, where are we at? Where is it working on the woman's neurons? <laughs> you know, it's very interesting. We live in a generation where tefillin and tzitzis would be perfect for women. Perfect for women. Yeah, because women have ma masculinized and the men have feminized. And really... Men, like, I'm not even sure it's villains healthy for men at this point. You know, like, like, we're so strapped down as it is. 
you know, we are on the altar, you know, and w the women are slaying us, while while m while women have become these like, you know, he man ma man haters, and and they're like, and they're like, need, they need to fill in, and they need sitsis. Women need to fill in and sitsis today, and now I'm not saying they should put it on necessarily. And I don't know what other halachas are involved. Maybe they have to go to a mikvah. I don't know what's involved with tefillin as far as mikvah for women and stuff like that. But nothing? I don't know. But bottom line is that everything's shifted. And it might be appropriate in this generation that women start putting on tefillin and put on sitsis. I'm sorry, and put on sitsis. Um, I don't believe there's too many women out there who would do that responsibly, though. I feel like most women who would do that, it would be some kind of trying to be like man thing well, if you want to try like if you want to try in 2019 to be like a man so just be a woman <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> anyway um but let, let guys i don't want to get i don't want to get too crazy here because i told you my class are crazy what i want is what i want is is to talk about our, our constant mention of god being king and you should know, by the way, this is, this is why Rosh Hashanah is before Yom Kippur. Because Rosh Hashanah, the whole world flips over. So much so that you should like, if you hate tomatoes, Rosh Hashanah day, you should eat tomatoes. Try one. Because who says you still hate it? That was last year. Like, don't, don't go with last year's calling and last year's, you know, idiosyncrasies. You know, like, like check out how the world is on Rosh Hashanah. So why in such a new world should you come in with last year's sins, with your soiled garments? And the answer is, is because you so, you're so far gone at the end of a whole year that you've totally forgotten God's king. And, though, and so for you to like go inside and figure out where you've been all year is almost impossible because you don't have any clarity. Just like a man who forgot to tell his wife he's going to Vegas for a three-day trade show and calls her from Vegas saying, I am so sorry, I forgot to tell you. Yeah, so that is the ultimate symbol of their relationship, which is just as much her fault as his fault. Because because breach in contract, of breaching contract, is always a symbol of the level of connectivity in the, between the two parties, and and the and so too with God as King. You're at the other end of the year. I mean, you're like God's like, God's something you think about sometimes, but not often, and. And your behavior is always going to be based on your God awareness. If you have God awareness as king, it really affects your behavior. If you've lost that, if that's gotten foggy, well, that's going to really affect your behavior as well. And so even though we would prefer to go into a brand new year so, so new that you like, you're not even allowed to say you don't like tomatoes. So certainly, shouldn't we clean off before that? And the answer is you wouldn't have the clarity. You wouldn't have the clarity. You need the clarity, and the clarity comes through Rosh Hashanah. And that, that little alarm, the little alarm clock that wakes you up. You ever thought about those to those tones? You ever thought about those tones? One tone is pure, straight, connected. That's total intimacy. Yeah. And then there's they actually have to be the same length. And that's that's you losing clarity. That's you losing clarity and doing stupid stuff and being spaced out to reality of your true connection, of your ultimate connection. And that's why it's called shvari, from the word shet, or broken. It's when you break by, by ma making stupid moves, yeah? And the word, by the way, tikiya, tikiya, you know what that means? In that, you know what it means to be, <coughs> I mean, you all know it's that long <coughs> glass, tikiya, but it also means to be like, when you drive a stake in, it's tokea. When you drive stakes into the ground to set up a structure or something. Yeah, it's takua. Meaning my relationship with God is takua. It's, it's staked in all the way. And that's, that's tikiya. But the problem is, is we're all born pure like that. We're all born in a tikiya fashion. Like, we're all, it's just totally true when we're born. Totally vulnerable. Totally true. Totally connected. There's no more intimate person in the world than it toddler being held by their parent you know it's like it's just absolute vulnerability to the relationship and thank god good parents can answer that vulnerability with with constancy continued continuity of love and connectivity and that's how we're all really born 
And that's us the day after Yom Kippur. But what happens over the years, we get to, or what happens in one's lifetime, is they get broken by situation. Stuff happens. And all of a sudden they're hurt, and there's broken hearts, shiv, shivarim. The heart gets broken. That happens in our lives. I'm going on multi-levels now, so I see if you can hold parallel classes at the same time. So it's your own life getting broken, an embarrassing moment, anything that might have gone wrong growing up or whatever, all those inner thoughts that kids have about themselves that, of course, sadly, they don't share with their parents who would have immediately told them it wasn't true, but we didn't share it because we didn't want to disappoint them. And it just became this like gigantic snowball thought about ourselves, which becomes eventually a vibrational reality that attracts more and more of the same exact interactions with the world, which winds up stamping these broken, the broken sense of self as true. But it's also us throughout the year, that's the parallel, us throughout the year, is you leave Rosh Hashanah, sorry, Yom Kippur, as like this newborn. That's why God puts us in a nursery for a week. After Yom Kippur, you go to the sukkah for a week. You're in the nursery for a week. And you're just going to live with what you believe is true for a week. You know, and just, you're not going straight to the streets. You're going straight into a sukkah for a week. But as the year goes on, we lose clarity, and then things start getting broken up. Now, here's, here's the key that a lot of people don't understand, and it's only because we're, we're literally scared to death of the next stage. The next stage is when you start sobbing. Yeah, when you start sobbing. And unfortunately, most people find themselves not living the most inspired lives. I mean, I, I, would say, I would say I get to meet inspired people every day, but I get to meet many more who aren't. And it's always because they're holding some gigantic, massive volcanic eruption cry, like a convulsive sob inside of them. Person after person after person. I meet, once in a while I meet someone who's just got it because he knows how to sob. He knows how to get it all out. And once you get it out, where is it? Everyone say, out. Out. Right? Once you get it out, where is it? Out. When you hold it in, where is it? Out. And there it festers and rots. And so we all live uninspired because we can't, you can't get to, to, to Kia. You can't get to Tequila without, 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 um, uh, Trua. And what's Trua? What's it mean, Trua? What's it mean, Lito Rero? What's Trua? Like, to wake up. Well, how are you going to wake up? And the answer is when you sob. The guy comes back from Vegas. He finds his bedroom door locked with a note on the door. Go to the couch. He goes to the couch. There's bedding set up there. Next morning, he's sitting having his coffee with his wife, and he's like, he's like, you know, coming up with every stupid excuse. It means nothing to her. Day after day, it goes like this until he finally gets to enough reckoning to realize where the relationship was. And she wasn't the cause of that, because she's always at home waiting for connectivity, waiting for eye contact, waiting for, for, uh, for tr you know, true intimacy and and so but what happens how is he getting in that bedroom how is he ever getting back in there only one thing will do it what is it Sorry. when he cries when he cries mm. I use this system all the time actually for all kinds of things you know I'll have a, I'll have a big talk I have to make in some place where I'm so out of my realm you know like all these people are PhDs and I'm like I left school when I was 11 <laughs> you know, and I'm so out of it, and and so, and I gotta go give this talk, and you know my true is long gone, broken beyond, you know, from like being able to, you know, be give a talk in such circles, and then so what do I do? I share with my wife, you know, w my real beliefs about myself in the face of these like heavy intellectuals, and and then I tell her. Who I am, you know, who I am is, is a brilliant but creative, you know, I'm a brilliant creative gift to humanity. You know what she says? Go back and work on it. And I'm like, what do you mean? 
that was it, no? And she's like, you didn't cry. And I'm like, you want me to cry? <laughs> it's just a talk for a bunch of intellectuals at Hebrew University, like, give me a break. She's like, you want to be great there. You want to be great there. Why don't you cry out what's going on inside of you? I don't mind you cry it out with me and cry it out by yourself, but go cry something out. And she's right every time. And I find the tears and I cry out something that's some unrectified part of me that probably is from God knows what happened in math class. You know? <laughs> we all have a big sob. And you want to you wanna find that sob somewhere between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur every year. You want to find that sob in your own personal development. And, uh, and there's one more thing that's really important is this, this area here. There's this whole area there. This area here is the smoke screen. This area here is the smoke screen that blocks you. This is the smoke screen. It's, uh, I can fill in the, the middle of it, maybe. I mean, it's pretty full, but I'll just fill in this little area here. This is the smoke screen. To be blunt, to be very blunt, can't get anywhere in this work, whether it be the parallel, we did two, we're doing two parallels, one with, is with God as king over our lives, and the other is with, uh, meaning that total clarity of teruah, sorry, of uh, tekiah, but also in our own personal growth is you are the biggest bluffer in the world. You are a total bluffer. You're a bluffer. And you know you're a bluffer and you never tell the truth. You never tell the truth. In what regard? In the deepest, craziest regards, because you don't even know this is going on. And that's the scary part. That's why I said no one ever gets here, because we don't even know we're doing this. See, human beings cannot help but create narratives around dysfunction. Human beings cannot help but create narratives around dysfunction. Uh, let's go, uh, we're gonna call it, we'll call it A is service of God. Just uh, in case people aren't following the two classes, we're doing two classes at once here. I don't normally do two classes at once. And B is your, uh, your personal identity. And they're, they're very connected, obviously, but, but the, uh, we're doing two parallel words. So we'll call them from now on A and B. So, so I've never met anyone, I've never met anyone who's doing some stupid thing, who's observant, fully observant here, who's doing some stupid thing that when I ask him, what the hell are you thinking, that he doesn't have like a whole narrative of why this is exactly what's up right now. And this is like, this makes all the sense in the world to him and sometimes to his community. <laughs> and... <laughs> You know, coming from Jerusalem, where I, you know, I travel a lot to speak, I'll be in the community, just like, okay, you know, great, you know, and, and by the way, I'm never going to judge anybody, because I'm doing my stupid thing, because I'm in my stupid bluff, and my, of course being called out all the time by my wife, just going like, you know, you'd think, by the way, don't think rabbis are not under full scrutiny, okay, if you're married to a Jewish woman, you are, you are, you are, you live inside an MRI machine. Okay, but this MRI tests not just you know your actions and physical. It tests emotion. It tests it tests everything, and you're like, and you're just like exposed always, which is really amazing for us. Uh, but it really messes us up because of our the narratives that we create around our our idiots and the lies we'll tell ourselves. Our um, you know, it's just like it's a little uncomfortable to be married. However, however, they, they, you know, on those, in our weak moments, <laughs> we can actually, um, we can actually listen. You know, what's really interesting is uh, men get super defense. 
<laughs> we get super. I'm, I'm, I'm an we get super defensive. Like the second my wife goes in, yeah, I go defensive. Like, like that. You know, so I, I like I don't even drink my own Kool Aid here. So I get defensive, and and etc. And um. The the uh, oh, just something really amazing is is there's a compound called MDMA. It was once a club drug called ecstasy. It probably still is actually, but I wouldn't know. I'm not exactly at clubs having ecstasy. But but there there was a club drug called ecstasy. I never got to try it because I was a surfer trying to wake up at dawn to catch waves, and something about dancing all night wasn't going to work out well with that. So. Anyway, but they, right now it's being researched in Israeli uh, universities and in England and in the Netherlands and in UCLA and Johns Hopkins and NYU. And, and what they're finding is that it, this particular compound is getting, an, it has 80% effectivity with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety. You can Google it, it's amazing. Anyway, but what happened, as I have students all over the world, I start getting, I start getting WhatsApps from friends of mine years and years and years and years ago that became observant with me at age or they're friends of mine from college or friends of mine from high school. We're all married for years and years and years and years and years. That there's something called MDMA couples therapy where the couple takes MDMA together and while the woman goes in on them, while she digs in with all the hurt for their entire married life, all the hurt, she's just boom, boom, boom. You ready for this? He, he, sits there and cries the whole time until he just hugs her and says, I can't believe I did this to you. Wow. So I'm getting these WhatsApps from all over the world that this is a, so I immediately, you know, I got a bunch of WhatsApps. I was ignoring them because I'm just too busy, but I finally wound up Googling it and finding amazing stuff from this. Now, by the way, people have to be careful with this because all it does is take the serotonin, that's your morning stuff, when, you, when the sunlight hits you, there's something called serotonin, which says, daytime, and happy, you know. And, uh, and now, obviously, people who live in darker climates, winter time versus dark most of the time, there's less serotonin, they can have issues with depression there and stuff. And, and that's why uh, antidepressants are always messing with serotonin, but they're crazy dangerous, and, and they, you can't get off of them, and it's a whole nightmare. I mean, I just met a guy last night, it was eight months of one of the top doctors in the entire U.S., to get him off one antidepressant. It took him eight months to get him off it until he could dial it in enough that he could get off. Because you're hooked? It's not a question. I'm hooked, but the, you, once you start playing around with serotonin with those things, it's dangerous. Anyway, at night, you have something totally different at night. There's something that's called melatonin, mm -hmm. and melatonin then excretes, and then you sleep the night, and you dream and everything. That's melatonin. What's very interesting is we have a gland in the center of our head called the pineal. Pineal means the face of God, and it's not, it's, it really means that, meaning the Latin got it from the Hebrew. Pineal means the face of God. Wow. And that's what, uh, it was at Yaakov and Esau we were wrestling, and he said, I, I saw the face of God, pineal. So we have a gland there. You want to hear something amazing about this gland? It's the weirdest thing. It has visual cones. You know how your eye have visual cones? So it turns out you have three eyes. You have this eye, that eye, and you have a pineal gland right in the center. Uh, Indians put a dot on their forehead. I saw two of them yesterday. Uh, it's not so often in Jerusalem you get to see Indians with dots on their forehead. The but they, uh, in, the two, in the two face calcifies that. Uh, yeah, we, no one uses fluoride these days. I mean, uh, it's, uh, and be careful, the red, uh, the red bottles, they put fluoride in there. So the, the red ones. What's that called? Nivio or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah, stay away from those. And, uh, yeah. By the way, you can finish your bottle. It's not going to be like... You're gonna lose all. You're, you're not gonna lose all. You're not gonna lose all sight of God. You know. So anyway, but there. Turns out your pineal gland, your pineal gland has visual cones. Have you ever noticed while you're asleep with your eyes closed in the dark that you can see tons of stuff when you dream? Like you're you're you have you're you have X-ray vision. I mean, your vision's going everywhere, and it's amazing stuff. And the, and you're actually seeing stuff all the time. And that's your pineal gland. That's uh, seeing all that stuff with the visual cones inside of there. And again, yeah, fluoride, they say calcifies it, and there's ways to decalcify it. And uh, anyway, um, what I want to share with you, there was something really amazing, a whole other fact I was going to share. Let's get back to our class. 
So we're all inside this crazy bluff. And by the way, I'm not accusing anybody. It's just human psyche. Human psyche creates narratives around stuff. We have narrative around stuff. Meaning, let's say someone had a horrible, horrible trauma and finds themselves causing horrible trauma to others as an adult. That person's inside a narrative where all of this makes sense because human beings only do what makes sense. And we'll create a narrative around why it makes sense. Like, you know the famous line, hurt people, hurt people. Hurt people, hurt people. Why? You've been hurt. I mean, if, if I get hurt, I make a darn sure I don't hurt somebody that way. I know what it feels like. So, like, if I've been hurt, so that's, oh, thank you for letting me know how to be sensitive to others such that they won't get hurt. That's the way most of us think, and that's why Hillel said to the, to the potential convert, he said, don't do unto others what was hurtful to you, because that's the basis of Menschlichkeit, like the beginning of like, you want to be a Jew? Well, let's start with not falling into, you know, some crazy narrative of, of doing unto others what was hateful to you, which is the natural state, natural state of unrealized people, of people who are fast asleep inside narratives. That's the bluff. They're inside the narrative of their life. And so when you, when you, when you blow out of that narrative, the very beginning of that is to make sure you're not, you're not wounding where you're wounded. You don't want to be wounding anybody where you're wounded. That's the beginning. Like That's before you get anywhere, is to do that. Now, now, let us go into a bracha. There's an amazing bracha that we make every day, three times a day, actually. That's just so beautiful. I don't know if we have a sitter here. But it's all right. I, I know it by heart. I think I'll pull it off, even though my brain's like half on. You know, I, I think I was in the schwitz a little too long. Um, I have like, inc thank you. I have incredible love. Uh, Incredible capacity to sit in a sauna. I felt so bad. This guy, this guy named Ari Pfefferkorn in England, who created J Trade. It's uh, the biggest trade show in all of uh, England for the Jewish community. And the uh, <laughs> so I was like, oh, perfect. You know, I need businessman like that with a bright red, bright orange Range Rover. With the word, you know, in the Hasidic community, you don't drive it bright red Range Rovers. It's like, this guy's got to be a Schwitzer. So I WhatsApp him Friday morning. I'm like, I'm like, hey, you want to pick me up and take me to Schwitz? <laughs> anyway, he wound, up, he wound up waiting for me for like two hours upstairs, schmoozing and WhatsApping and stuff. Upstairs. Well, I was getting slammed by leaves by some naked Russian man. If I'm not mistaken, the shaman say that... Right out of my nose to water. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so here's the bracha. Here's the bracha. It goes like this. Hashiva. Hashiva, like teshuva. Oh, I just want to say one thing that's so awesome. This, you want to hear my latest discovery in Shimon Yisrael, you, you'll realize in your life of doing Shimon Yisrael, it's the silent meditation, you discover things that you've been saying forever that you never thought about. So here's an amazing one. We ask God 13 bakashot, 13 <coughs> is a bakashot, um, <coughs> what? Request, but there's a better word for that, but. Supplication. No, it's Supplication? a, supplications. We ask God, we beg God for like 13 things. And what are those 13 things? They're 13 things that like God needs to have happen here before, you know, Mashiach. They're, they're very important things, like the re return of the Jews to Israel, the rebuilding of, you know, this, the, et cetera, the bringing back the, the, you know, the courts and everything. That's one we're going to be focusing on. And, but what's really interesting is at the end of every bracha, we say, Baruch Hashem, and then we say, you know, do it. You know, you know, do create the judgment or bring back the Jews or we. It's almost like a command, except for tshuva. Tshuva says harotze, this is tshuva, harotze. Who who 
Blessed are you, God, who desires tshuva. Why don't we demand this one? Because that's up to us. Yeah, it's up to us. He wants us to do tshuva, but he cannot do that. Because we have free will there, and it's up to us whether we're going to come back to him. Really amazing. I mean, years, I'm saying, years. And I was up in a winery, probably the wine helped a lot, with a bunch of smashed guys. And we are in a winery in the Shomron, and I did, you know, I did the 45-minute Shimone Esri with the ear pods playing, you know, spa music. I highly suggest doing that during Shimone Esri. And spa? Spa, yeah, and I asked a rub, actually. I asked a rub. It's amazing. It's just unbelievable. You can do Shimone Esri with music? It's not really music. It's kind of like nondescript spa music. But I found the ultimate. No, but with classical music or something. Classical music would also be too busy. You, you need something that's just new long age. notes. New age. Yeah, new age type stuff. And, and uh, yeah, you do Shimon answer to that. It's just, wow. So, by the way, I don't do that every time because ain't nobody got time for that. So, <laughs> but if I do have time for that, forget about it. Five minions will go by at the Kotel while I'm still in my Shimon Esri, you know, in that one spot. Like it just keeps regathering, and, but you can't hear them, which is awesome. And then as soon as you get to Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh in a minion, you just touch the volume model down a little bit, and, and now you just get Kadosh, 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 and you know, you're all set. But one amazing thing, and everyone should know this, those who are big into meditation, is that if you're if you only got to the third bracha, meaning this, you finish the second bracha, when the leader is repeating it, you know, the repetition's going on and you only got to the, you're just finishing the second bracha. So you can say, Kadosh, 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 Baruch Hashem, Baruch Kvod Hashem in Koimoi, and Yimloch, according to Shulchan Aruch HaRav, which is plenty for us knuckleheads to rely on, considering all the other stupid stuff we rely on. Okay, so, so you, Yimloch Hashem, meaning those who aren't Shulchan Aruch Ravniks can definitely say Yimloch, for sure. And we say, and we do say Yimloch, almost everyone says Yimloch. So it's really great, because some people don't want to miss that. Well then just, just do a really long first bracha. Now, um, what are we talking about? Why are we talking about that? Oh yes, thank you. Hashiva Hash, Shofatenu. Return, return. Now, Shofatenu means our judges, so in Pshat it means bring us back our courts, you know, bring us back the Shoftim. Real judges of, of Sanhedrin. You know, there's three Sanhedrin. There's Gedoyla, then there's the Katana, and then there's just Bastin. But bring us back our judges of Shofatenu. But what else could be Shofatenu? And the answer is our judgment. Shofet means judge. And shofetena means our judgment. Bring back our judgment. Meaning, meaning I've lost some clarity here. Yeah. Oh, we actually have a, we have our muscle. We can't forget our muscle. <laughs> so, I've lost some clarity here. And, and now I've, created a whole like narrative of how things are how my relationship's supposed to be based on whatever crazy narrative which probably has a lot to do with my parents marriage which is what usually seeps in the most and um, and and I or or I've just kind of lost clarity and that's my judgment so bring our bring back our judgment were shown up like at the beginning when we had it was the day after Rosh Hashanah and we're just like totally put together with our relationship with God our relationship with our spouse or how we saw ourselves as toddlers as these just incredible beings we were trusting our hearts in, in people's hands bring that back Vyoat Senu the second one was Vyoat Senu Kvat Chila that's the bluff why? because once you're broken once you're broken, the words, what's the word eights I mean? Advice. advice. You become your own advice giver. You become your own advice giver. 
you and if you do ever ask a rabbi you ask it in such a way that it's perfectly going to fit your needs and and so in other words yoatsenu and um Vyatsenu Kvatchila means get us back to having our heads on straight. Because we'll give ourselves all kinds of advice during the year of what we think is like exactly what we should be doing. Remember earlier I was saying like like that is what the hell are you doing to some guy? And he's like, it, it'll explain exactly why. So this is the Yoatsenu. The story we tell ourselves that somehow we will fit even the craziest thing in, including like, for example, abusive people. I was trying to bring an extreme example. That was our abusive part, the wound, hurt people, hurt people. That even abusive people, I, have, I always have several students in jail, okay? I always have several people. Right now I only have like maybe three. But I speak to them. I've never in all these years, and there's been many, many, because every year there's a group of students in jail, and I've never, ever spoken to someone who was guilty, ever. It's the weirdest thing. I mean, I never, no one's ever guilty. And I have another student going to jail, who I'll leave nameless. And, uh, and I promise you, they're innocent. Sorry. <laughs> They'll promise you. <laughs> I promise you they're guilty. <laughs> They'll promise you they're innocent. Like the, whole, the jails are just filled with innocent people. <laughs> I don't want to share too much about my screenplay, but it's going to be like blockbuster. But just to give you the, just to give you the, I'll just give you a hint of it, is that there's a certain point during the film where you realize the only innocent people are the ones who healed because of some guy who <coughs> healed himself inside. Until you start to realize during the film that the only innocent people are the ones in jail. And everyone out of jail is guilty. It's the wildest, freaky movie that's going to be going on. I mean, I, it's just amazing. I got to get it done. Can you be in charge of me, please, to make sure I, I just write this out? Okay, there's someone waiting for it. People, people would literally pay $1,000 just to get in to get their script to this guy. Who's like a drinking buddy. <laughs> okay, so... But you hear where it's developing there? It's a really crazy, s freaky, psycho-thriller movie. Anyway, the... The Yoatsenu Kvat Yoatsenu is... Our advice giving is just totally off. And it's based on brokenness. I Meaning there was brokenness. And so I started looking at myself in all these crazy ways. Then I started giving all my, myself all kinds of... Eight's advice on how life should work out. And you ready for this part? This is going to blow you away. Those who are easily blown away or even not, but know what the hell I'm talking about. Vaser mimenu. Vaser mimeni. Mimenu. And take away from us what? Yagon v'anocha. Those are crazy words to be showing up in Shemona Esrei. Yagon is almost untranslatable, and Anacha is almost untranslatable. They don't really have English equivalents. The only thing you could say is sputtering, sputtering, convulsive sobbing. Wow. There's no English for these words. Yagon va Anacha, they, we don't have vocabulary for what that means. All it means is that all your toxic emotions that come from buildup of years and years and years and years of betrayal to your true self. What is Hasen? Hasen is take away from us, remove. Hasen means remove from us. How do you get that stuff removed? Well, you gotta go down that rabbit hole, don't you? You have to go down the rabbit hole of the brokenness and you gotta peel off the bluff that you've over, you know, superimposed over all the dysfunction. And this, this is the work that I discovered like 18 years ago and started my company. I now have 8,000 graduates going through this. 8,000 graduates around the world. Next stop, Muncie. 
The 28th of July. We're in July, aren't we? That's soon. That's next. That's not this Sunday. That's next Sunday. Yeah, next Sunday. It's going on. Men starts 28th. Women starts the 29th. And highly suggested to, if you're watching this, man, get to Muncie and fly in. There's, I've never done a seminar in Muncie without people flying in from all, all over. We just did one in Israel. A guy flew in from China. A, a Jewish businessman from China showed up, which was amazing. And, uh, and another guy flew in from Toronto two weeks ago. But uh, um, what was I going to say? The stop after that is Stanford Hill, London. Stanford Hill, London. Right in the heart of it all over there. Is there London. For women to London? London's going to have women as well. Okay. Yeah. London is the third week of September. I forget what the date is. It's, oh, the numbers go. That shouldn't be too hard because the first week starts on Sunday, which is the first of September. It's also the first of Elul. It's going to be a very easy month for Hebrew English. So it's, what's the third week start? What's Sunday? The 21st, right? That's the third week. Seven, right? Yeah. Seven, fourteen, twenty-one. Yeah, I'm getting good at math. Okay, guys, what's the next line? What happens when you do that? What was this whole class about? Making God king, or being pure, or having full, having full intimacy in your relationships. V'sim loch aleinu. V'sim loch aleinu. And you shall reign over us. V'sim lo chaleinu tukia. V'sim lo chaleinu, but it goes further. V'sim lo chaleinu. Sorry, umloch. Sorry, v'sim lo. Umloch. I really blew that too because Sfardi were like, what, what is sim loch anyway? Yeah. Would have been tim loch. <coughs> umloch aleinu and rule over us. Ata. Ata is always code word for essence. Highest name of God's. That's God's highest name. Meaning the four things you call him in a bracha. Ata, Hashem, Elkeinu, and Melech. That's the highest. It means essence. And may your essence rule over us. Hashem. Yudke, Vavke. And here's the best. Here's the kicker. Levadacha. Levadacha. Alone. Meaning only you. Marriage, only you. The beautiful child in you, only you. Only you rule over me. And that courage that every two-year-old has to say the funniest stuff, and that courage that they have to, to love and to give their heart and to trust, only you rule over me. None of the stupid, like, constant stories I tell myself of why I can't be close to people. None of that, none of that narrative. But you, none of the stupid moves I make all year because of my loss of clarity, because really I feel broken before God and therefore <coughs> make up <coughs> stupid reasons. But only you, God. You alone. Atal Hashem Lavadacha. You alone rule Not, not, my, not my judgment calls, and then all the, that are totally off, and all the advice I give myself how to live based on stupid calls about myself. That's not what's ruling over me anymore. You rule over me. And that's tekiya. So the thing actually ends with tekiya. Um loich ata Hashem levadacha is tekiya. Like a sandwich. It's, it is, this is just a sandwich. But this sandwich, ladies and gentlemen, that you've been hearing every Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, this sandwich, which you've been hearing every Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, is the process of personal transformation, period. It's just put in, in ineffable <coughs> tones on Rosh Hashanah. Why? Why is it not? Intellectual Jews are intellectual. We're analytical. Why is it put in these tones that are that are just, you know, without content? And the answer is, is because, because the the highest truth 
the highest truth has no content. The, meaning the highest truth is not sophisticated. The highest truth is not, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't take a genius. It ta you know what it does? It takes a genius to mess it up. That's what it takes. Mm -hmm. The highest truth comes in just a, 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 a tone. A tone of constancy, a, a, a connectivity that, that is not broken up. Hello, everybody. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you.